Hello all, welcome back. So in this tutorial, I am going to discuss the hardware design part of our snake game. So I am calling, going to call it snake to indicate this is the snake game on the Z board. Okay, so let me initially briefly explain the logic. Then we will look at the hardware design. So if you are designing this uh, game, it doesn't matter whether on hardware or software, the general idea is the same. So first what you will do is you will consider your entire display as a grid of squares okay so we logically partition our display into a, a grid of squares now what should be the size of the grid or basically the number of squares on your display that you can set so depending upon the size you set the the size of your playing area changes or effectively the size of snake everything changes and uh, whenever you display the snake it will be always in the multiples of the squares so here you can see my snake is here so each uh, square here makes one body part of the snake and when we draw it on the screen we will put some at least one pixel border here so that when the snake crosses itself you can distinguish between its body otherwise you will see a big uh, rectangle here so you don't know like where is the head where is the tail so we usually put some space in between so that it is clear now the prey uh, in my design it's always uh, one square in size but you can make it uh, multiple square so that you have small prey large prey and uh, you can give a score based on the size of the prey things like that okay so the snake it moves under two conditions under two events okay so whenever the user presses a valid button because not all button presses are valid uh, suppose snake is going right if you suddenly press the left button nothing should happen similarly it is going up and if you press down button nothing should happen so if a user presses a valid button the snake should immediately move that is one case other case is uh, after a fixed amount of time the snake should move okay so if even if you are not doing anything the snake will be always moved so these are the two conditions under which the snake is uh, going to move now by controlling the amount of time which generates this movement this second event uh, you can control the speed of the snake okay. so the smaller the this time amount the faster will the snake will move and one more thing we need to take care uh, is irrespective of the duration of the button press for the user for one button press the snake should move only once if you keep on pressing the button if you press it and hold it uh, the snake shouldn't keep on moving it should move once and that's it you you need to release the button and press again for for the next time now yeah, when we draw the snake on the screen uh, we will need following information so that drawing part will be done from software so we need to know the size of the snake how many squares are there in the body of the snake and we need to know the location of each body segment in the grid okay so these two information we need now again software hardware what you can do is you can store this information in an array what is the position of each body segment and when the snake moves the head part the first square it will always receive a new position depending upon the direction in which it is moving now every other section every other square will be moving to the position of the previous square right so that's the logic so when this snake is moving right the head he will have a new position but this cell he will take the position of this cell this cell he will take the position of this cell so on and so forth and the last cell uh, it will become empty if the snake is not uh, growing okay if the snake catches a prey this last segment remains there otherwise this should become an empty cell and everyone else moves to the next position so that is the look so this looks like some kind of shift operation and uh, that is very efficient to do in hardware so if I implement a shift register you know I can shift the entire conduct of the shift register in a one single clock cycle but if you are using software based shift that is not the case 
you may need some follow-up. We will discuss it uh, in in Lament software. If you are not very smart, you will have to do as many shifts as the size of the stake. So in that sense, uh, hardware is much efficient because I can do it in uh, one clock cycle. So next I will discuss the different IPs that we are going to use. So we have to develop some of our own IP and finally we will combine them to build the entire hardware. So in hardware design I am starting from our previous uh, VDMA block design because we still need the video so that part remains same. Okay, So that is the starting point. The first thing we are going to build is something called a debounce logic. So it serves two purposes actually. One is avoiding debouncing when we press a button. You can just go and search what debouncing is if you haven't heard that term before. So one thing it uh, makes sure there is no debouncing when we are pressing the push buttons. And second one, uh, it makes sure for one button press there is only one pulse generator. Okay, so here I am, I am defining some constant. What is my clock frequency? I am planning to run at 100 megahertz. That I will explain why, because our video part, it is running at 148 megahertz. So this design actually uses two clock domains also, 100 and 148. So clock frequency is this much, and this is basically defining what should be the minimum duration of pressing to consider it as a valid button press. So if you press, uh, anything less than 0 0.01 seconds, that is like 10 millisecond, it won't be taken as a valid button press. You need to press at least for that time. Okay, so of course, you'll be pressing that much. So what we are doing is we basically have a counter and that counter will keep on incrementing until it reaches this uh, product, okay? Product between these many. That means those many clock cycles have elapsed and once it reaches that value, it remains there. Okay, otherwise the counter will overflow, go back to zero, and we will have problem. So it reaches that maximum value and it remains there. And as soon as you release the button, not of button, uh, that counter will become zero. So in our uh, voting machine design, also we have used similar logic. And for generating this single uh, pulse, this is what I am doing. When the counter reaches this maximum value minus one, this signal will become one and in all other cases it will remain zero okay so if you put uh, counter equal to clock count this signal will become high and it will remain high okay but that's not what we need we want a single pulse so you can choose any value between zero and clock count minus one here it will serve the purpose so same effect will happen so this will become high for one clock then it will become zero okay so this, since this is a very small logic i have directly return it in the same project so that we can just drag and drop it into the block diagram. Okay, so that we will do later. But other pieces of hardware, I'm going to write them as separate IP cores. Okay, so the first IP core I'm going to make is called a timer. It's a very simple IP. So the purpose of this IP is to generate the timing event. So as we discussed before, after a certain amount of time, we need to move the snake. So we need to generate a timing event that is done by this IP. It's a axi light uh, IP. So as discussed before, you start it as a uh, axi for IP and you just modify it from the template. Again, logic is very, very simple. You will get timer from Xilinx IP cores, but uh, they have either very simple IP, like a fixed interval, you cannot change the value inside the timer it will always run for the same amount of clock cycles that you specify you cannot change it during runtime or they are uh, more than what we need so i need a very simple timer where i should be able to change the value during runtime okay so the so the duration which the timer will run that i should be able to modify i should be able to enable or disable the timer. these are the only two requirements so that's why we are writing our own timer so what the timer does is it has a counter inside here and uh, whenever you press reset okay counter is zero so this is our some kind of interrupt signal okay so this is like an interrupt signal what this signal does is whenever the counter this is a down counter, so it will start from some high value and it will count down. And whenever it reaches zero, this signal will become one to indicate that counter has uh, overflowed. 
and that signal we are going to use as the timing event so whenever the signal become high we may move the snake so that's the logic so again under reset it is zero so we have this counter enabled bit here so only if this bit is high our counter will work and that is coming from slave register zero bit so slave register zero i'm using kind of control register so from software i can enable or disable my counter using this one and as i discussed before if counter becomes zero what it does is it will uh, reload this uh, counter value from slave register one so from software again we should store the initialization value in slave register one uh, whenever the counter offers you will just restore this value from here to here and in all other cases he will just keep on down counting so we may start from some high value we down count we reach a zero we will make this signal high and we will reload the timer we will make this signal low in the next clock itself this is the style we use in with log and he will just count down again okay so that's what this counter is doing so again i have packed it into uh, ip format so that we can directly use it in our block design now the main ip that we are going to use i am calling it the snake tracker again this is also an axi light ip code but it is uh, much complicated than our time up, okay so this is the core logic so there is something called the core tracker which is a sub module inside our ip this is the guy who is keep tracking of the snake so here you can see some parameters so here maximum snake length i have defined it as 1600 that means the max size of our snake cannot be more than 1600 this you can go and change increase or decrease now if you increase it the resource utilization uh, increases okay so we shouldn't go for all kill we are going for a harder design so don't put it too high and this is one reason why we are not going to run at 148 megahertz so as the size of the snake increases the hardware logic becomes higher and higher which prevents our max f max maximum clock frequency at which we run if it is maybe uh, 400 500 you can definitely run at uh, 150 megahertz no issue but for larger values when i check there were timing failure so that's why the snake part we are going to run at 100 megahertz okay so here you will see a two-dimensional array this is basically the shift register which keeps track of the entire snake so it, it, it doesn't matter what is the current size of the snake the information of that entire 1600 cells will be always saved in hardware because in hardware we do not have this uh, dynamic memory allocation if you are building it using software uh, you don't have to declare a constant array like that as the size of the snake increases you can allocate uh, dynamic memory and you can increase the size of this shift register which gives the uh, snake information but in hardware uh, everything is fixed so you have to predefine what is the size of this array so it is uh, 1600 and each element in that 1600 is 16 bits wide okay so this is like a huge memory not very huge but uh, it's large enough you can see this is 1600 this is two bytes so it is like 3200 bytes that's the size of this memory now this is 16 bits because uh, lower 8 bits will store the x coordinate of a particular body part a square and the upper 8 bits it will store the y coordinate okay so that's why it is 16 bit now the remaining we will see why they are okay so okay so let's start here okay so this is the logic which is basically deciding whether a user button press is valid so the four push button left right top bottom you can see they are coming here from external world after going through that debouncing they'll be coming here so for one button press one of these signals or one or more of them will become high for a single clock cycle so what this logic does is it is basically checking whether a button press is valid or not okay so you can see the condition here if down button is pressed and this is basically saying what is the current direction of the snake so when we start our hardware it will always move right 
okay so if the down button is pressed and if the snake is not moving up and snake is not already moving down the new direction is down okay and we are also making another signal high button press high this signal become high for one clock cycle again uh, this acts like some kind of interrupt signal which will tell to move the snake by one position okay again it is important to make it high only for one clock cycle to make sure for one button press the snake moves only once so that is what this logic is doing now this part is the pick shift register and this part is explicitly for the head part of the snake okay all other cells will move uh, based on the previous cell position but the head part he always moves to a new position as i discussed before so again when we start our game the initial position of the head will be provided by software so that is coming through this signal i start position you can see uh, that is coming as an input to the core tracker which is actually connected to slave register 3 so from software i can control where should be the initial head position of my snake okay so that's why under reset it goes like that in all other cases so you can see there are two cases here i move and button press so button press we are generating from here when the user presses i move is coming from our timing event so the signal from our timer we will connect to this signal ultimately so whenever the timer gives an intro under these two conditions my head will move and the new position of the head is calculated based on the direction which we calculated here okay so if we are moving down okay this as i mentioned x y coordinates if i am moving down my y coordinate will increase because on the screen that's how okay y coordinate increases when you moves down and x coordinate increases when you move right so down up right left based on that we are recalculating the new coordinates of our head now this part is for the remaining entire body so every ith one except zero which is our head will take the position of the previous cell whenever uh, these events occur either button press or timer or flow now uh, other than head uh, you the other four squares they are also initialized when we press resets because when we start the game we need to see the snake and how big that snake will be again you can set it in software with some constraint so as you can see here i am initializing head here in addition to that i am initializing four other positions also and their positions are head position minus one minus one so you are basically uh, subtracting the x coordinate so you will see a snake uh, horizontally now from software you can set the size of snake as one two three four or five because the maximum size is five because here i am initializing only head and four other segment segments after that yeah whenever these events occurs the snake will move now this logic it basically checks whether uh, game over based on the condition that the snake bites itself Okay, so that is done by this logic so you can see what it basically does it is comparing the coordinates of the head cell with something called this o cell okay so let's see what is this o cell so as i mentioned before if we want to display the snake on the screen okay we need to know the position of every cell so that is done by software so he needs to get the position of every cell for that he will be reading uh, this shift register through software and where is that reading operation that read operation is similar to our fifo implementation so we have a read pointer here which is initialized to zero and whenever the software reads so you can see this signal i read position which is coming from here which is 
is connected to this signal and you can see when that signal is generated when this address is one so basically when software reads from slave register address one this signal will become high and whenever that signal become high uh, wherever the read pointer is the coordinate of that address is sent out to the software again this is connected to the top from there it will be going to the uh, software through our XE interface so that is what is happening so this all cell position basically indicates uh, the position of some cell which is currently read by software and software will be reading uh, as many cells as the size of the snake okay he doesn't have to read uh, whole uh, 1600 cells because software will be knowing what is the current size of the uh, snake so he will be reading only those many cells not the entire one so while software is reading it what this logic does is he will compare the position of the cell that the software is reading with uh, the head position and if they are same in addition to that we should not make this comparison when software is reading from the head position because they will always match so you should not compare head with head itself you should not compare with the uh, head with any body part greater than the size of the snake so this is the size of if this condition happens that means the snake bit itself so this bit will become high game over and it remains high until the research signal comes okay so this signal will be again read by software this one game over which is ultimately connected to address zero so when software reads from address zero he will understand like okay the snake bit itself so game over so that is what this logic is doing this logic is basically checking whether the position of the prey is in the body of the snake okay so you know like whenever the snake catches a prey a new prey has to be placed in the grid so that placing is partially done in software but uh, software he doesn't have the information about all the snake cells because that is sitting in hardware so what the software does is he will send the new position of the prey uh, to the hardware through this signal i prey position which again you can see is connected to which one here slave register one so that position will be given by software and what this logic does is similar to this one he will compare whether the given prey position is anywhere in the body of the snake okay if it is in the body of the snake he will make this signal high to tell the software like the new prey is in the body of the snake so he needs to replace the prey somewhere else and the software will be doing it okay now uh, this is uh, some corner cutting okay because uh, because you will see like the hardware it is depending upon the software reading the snake cell part to do this comparison so it may have some implication but uh, this makes the design more efficient actually you need uh, less hardware to do it otherwise it becomes very complicated if the hardware itself read this entire array and start comparing that may make uh, it more resource intensive okay so that's why we are using this logic okay so that's it so these are our major ips we will use one more ip the axi gpio ip because if i want to restart my game i need to press the center push button so that information should go to software for that we can directly use uh, silinx gpio ip and connect it to the button now for this snake tracker you will see there is a reset signal here i reset in addition to that our read it has a separate reset i can independently reset the read point alone because that i will need to do each time before i read from the uh, uh, from the shift register i will have to reset the read point so that's why he has a separate reset and all other reset they have this reset and both these resets they are not connected to the axi reset they are actually connected to slave register 0 bit 0 and slave register 0 bit 1 so this is what we call as a soft reset 
Okay, so you can issue reset to my logic by configuring my control logic. It is not directly connected to my global Axie reset signal. So this idea we call it as a soft reset. So I can selectively reset portion of my hardware by writing to the uh, registers. Okay, so again, this also I have packed uh, into IP. And uh, now we can actually complete our block design. So as I mentioned before, I'm starting from my video block design. And we have also configured the IP repo under settings. So you can see the repository is uh, configured to IP repo. And I have kept all my IP is in that folder. Okay. So let's go ahead and start. So first thing. Okay, easy thing is we first put these debounces and we can start from here. So I will just uh, drag and drop and Vivado will convert it into a block format and we need four debounces for the four push buttons. For the center button, since I am directly using Silynx GPIO IP, uh, we don't need a separate logic okay so he will have his internal logic for managing this debounce so we have our debounce logic here so we need four of them and these buttons we make external all of them and you can rename them i button left i button right so and so forth okay so that's what we'll do now the clock signal as i mentioned before the snake part he is going to run at 100 megahertz and our clock wizard here he is giving 148 megahertz so i will generate one more clock from this clock wizard logic so again remember this IP MMCM or PLL, it can generate up to seven clocks from a single clock frequency. So we already have 148. We can generate one more clock. I am asking for 100 megahertz, but he saying he can provide only 99.777. Again, reason is uh, he cannot find a, a dividing factor which can give me this particular frequency. Again, these details I will explain somewhere else. How exactly the PLLs work but this is good enough it is close to 100 good enough so we take that clock and uh, I'm going to connect that clock here okay so that part is done now let's bring our snake tracker IP which we just discussed so this is our snake tracker Again, it's an axi light IP, and we can see the up, down, left, right things. So we can connect all of them here. So you should be careful when you give the constraint to constrain these two uh, down. So better rename it like uh, button, something like button down, like that. Okay, so I have renamed them. So this down should connect to down, up to up, left to left, and right to right. Now we need to connect the slave interface. So this we need to connect to the GP port. Okay, so we already have connection automation. Now the thing is you can run it but he may mess things up so we will do it manually okay so this axi clock is again I'm going to connect to this 100 megahertz clock now this reset signal again you can connect it to the reset coming from this IP but a good design practice is the reset should be synchronized with the clock that you are connecting here so this clock is 100 megahertz and the reset coming from here is synchronized with 148 megahertz it will of course work if you connect but uh, that may cause issues under certain cases so better we make one more such processor reset system i'm copy pasting it and uh, we configure that to 100 megahertz and use it okay 
so this is the clock which is used for synchronization reset so i will connect this one there and external reset end is again we connect it to ps which is already coming here and uh, dcm locked i will again connect it to this lock signal and uh, we will connect the peripheral reset and signal here okay this we can do a connection automation s0 and uh, the clock source we need to choose the 100 megahertz here every 100 megahertz so that he doesn't mess up he used the same x interconnect you can see he made one more master interface and that is connected here but the clock for for this interface he has connected to this clock out so he has done properly now the only thing that is left is this one i move okay so this should come from the timing ip which basically says the timer has overflowed and the snake has to move okay so that should come from the timer as i mentioned before these are silence timers and this is our timer the symbol guy and his interrupt signal can be directly connected here okay i move and again he should also run at 100 megahertz so clock out to and reset in to the peripheral reset here and the slave interface again to gp either you can run connection automation or you can say you need three interfaces here because they are all going to gp and you can connect it here and these clocks you can connect to this one and this one to the peripheral reset here okay so that more or less completes our design so next we can check whether our design is right or wrong before that let's go to address editor and ask to assign all addresses and let's check and we are getting many warnings and errors so he's saying like for timer there is issue the clock and the clock winds of peripheral m0 interface axi timer interface must be connected to same clock and so on and so forth so our timer this is the clock and timer is connected to master interface here and master interface clock i connected to clock out one which is wrong so let's disconnect and uh, reset is correct so this clock should be connected to clock out two okay so let's check again okay everything looks correct but in the code i put it in git i did one more thing for overall smooth operation our vdma it also has a axi light interface which is coming from the same interconnect and currently that is running at 148 megahertz but uh, it's better all these things connected to gp runs at the same frequency because uh, you can see there is our gp0 clock here which is currently connected to this 148 megahertz and uh, things connected to gp they are actually running at uh, 100 megahertz it may cause problem i'm not sure so what i did was everything connected to gp0 they all run at 100 megahertz so this clock also let's connect to clock out 2 and this interface vdma light his clock also and uh, his reset also 
let's connect them also to 100 megahertz so that there is a clear separation of clock domains okay so we have the snake part the entire thing running at uh, 100 megahertz and our dma which is running at uh, 148.5 megahertz so that makes a better design so this is our one clock domain 148 megahertz which is using all hp port and this is our 100 megahertz domain which is using the gp port so you also need to change the master interface clock here because here m0 is now running at 100 megahertz and this reset also And also this S0 interface because S0 is connected to GP0. Now the GP0 clock is also changed. So let's connect that also to 100 megahertz. Okay, so this entire interconnect is now running at 100 megahertz. Only our HP interface it is running at uh, 148 megahertz let's revalidate that's it so that completes our hardware design and you need to give the constraints also i have already given so this remains same and uh, this is our four button oh so one thing i missed we need to add our gp for ip to control the center push button which enables the reset of our game so we just go and click the axi gpio this one from xilinx and uh, you just say always input it is only one bit i just want to connect the center button there and uh, that's it so you connect it this should also run at 100 megahertz so we can connect it here and the reset to this one and this is going outside okay so you can make it make external and the slave interface again to gp0 so again choose 100 megahertz here and that's it you should have connected to the same interconnect yeah so we have a very complex interconnect here you can see okay. so that's it so i have given all the pin constraint here just rename that output to button center and you just give the whatever name you give there based on that you give the constraint here and just go ahead and generate the bit stream so in the next tutorial we will discuss the software part what is already available in git so you can go and check out thank you